let's move to a ghost town where we can visit with our friends let's move to a ghost town sunday dinners with our
fancy. When I say fancy, I mean schmancy. Put on your tuxedo pantsy. Hard food, don't romance me. This feast, it better be fancy. Oh, it better be fancy. We know when a chicken dinner, won't you change my kitty litter? This feast, it better be fancy. Oh, it better be fancy. This feast, it better be fancy. Oh, it better be fancy. So keep your kibbles, keep your bits. Don't you make me beg for it. Don't you make me beg for it. Don't you make me beg for it. This feast, it better be fancy. Oh, it better be fancy. This feast, it better be fancy. Oh, it better be fancy. This feast, it better be fancy. Oh, it better be fancy. This feast, it better be fancy. Oh, it better be fancy. Yes, yes. Brand, let me help you understand. Oh, it better be fancy. Oh, it better be fancy. I will bite the hand that feeds me. Keep your chicken of the sea. Oh, it better be fancy. Oh, it better be fancy. You can shake that bag till the cows come home, but you will be sleeping alone. Oh, it better be fancy. Oh, it better be fancy. Oh, it better be fancy. This feast, it better be fancy. Oh, it better be fancy. Breaking my home with your hair. 
me Like you couldn't see How cause leads to effect You looked at me All nonplussed Could not believe I would reject Your advances on Your blackmail And your empty threats Then you said, come to me Like I was on payroll and rages with aggressive tendencies you know the usual aggressive tendencies And welcome to OMSI's Virtual Science Pub. My name is Rebecca, and I'm the Teen and Adult Engagement Assistant Manager, and I'm going to be your host tonight. I'm super excited to hear from our OSU panel of experts. Um, tonight, we're going to explore the wicked nature of tipping points. We'll discover core examples of large and abrupt changes in our environment and the impact environmental changes have on our human communities and ecosystems. Um, so we'll be learning about a lot of rad stuff tonight. Uh, OMSI is committed to sparking curiosity and igniting imaginations, even during the shutdown. So to help everybody else out at home, we've crafted and curated all sorts of engaging science activities and experiments that you can do at home to inspire you from the wonder of science. You can do it not even at home. You can do it in the park, in the street, at your grandma's house, wherever. Um, so visit omsi.edu for more information and resources. And if you do any of the science activities we have, uh, please send us photos or videos so we can uh, see how great a scientist y'all are. Putting on these live shows takes a lot of work and we have an amazing partner that helps us make that happen. So a big thanks and shout out to Stream for providing the live streaming services for tonight's Science Pub. We really appreciate y'all's support. Uh, also, I hope y'all enjoy the music during the pre-show tonight. We're excited to locate, showcase a local Portland artist, Strange and the Familiars. You can catch them at a Kindle concert later this fall. Um, we are super excited with some great news. Um, we would love to welcome you back into our museum, our physical, actual museum building, to experience body worlds and the cycle of life, and also tour the U.S. Blueback submarine. Advanced tickets are required, and the health and safety of OMSI guests and staff is our utmost priority, and we want you to feel comfortable and safe while discovering at OMSI. So to meet state guidelines and help limit the spread of COVID-19, OMSI has implemented some changes throughout the museum. If you're interested in exploring Body Worlds or the submarine, uh, please visit omsi.edu for more information and details. Also, as with Science Pubs, um, we want to help you put the pub back in Science Pub and support your local community. We have some wonderful food and beverage partners that I would encourage you to check out. They're all listed here on the screen. Um, we've got selections from around the state. And uh, yeah, get a drink, get some snacks to help get you through this great lecture. For the schedule tonight, it's going to be real similar to our regular science pub program and all of our other virtual science pubs if you've been with us any of these other weeks um, during quarantine. 
So what we will do is we're going to start with a tipping points themed trivia game. That'll be a warm up for tonight's talk. So you can grab a pen and paper or just shout out your answers um, for that'll be about 15 minutes. And then we'll have an hour long lecture by three different professors from the College of Earth, Ocean and Atmospheric Science at OSU. And for the Q&A, you can submit your questions at any point during the lecture via the comments in our live feed. We'll collect all of your questions, and then after the lecture, I will ask them to our speakers. If you enjoyed tonight's lecture, please consider making a donation or brand new information, uh, purchasing a Science Pub pint glass. Um, we're going to post the links in the comments section for more information if you want to donate or if you want one of these awesome little Science Pub pint glasses. Um, but don't worry, there's no pressure to donate. Our mission at OMSI is to inspire curiosity by creating engaging science learning experiences for people of all ages and backgrounds. So please sit back, relax, and get ready for a great lecture after you win all of the trivia. Um, this week, we have one of our wonderful, wonderful marketing team members to join us to play along live with y'all at home. So please give a warm welcome to John Farmer. Bah, 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 bah. Hello. Wow. Welcome, John. How's it going? Hi. How are you feeling? Um, it's a warm day today. So, you know, I'm in uh, shorts and a t-shirt, which is great news here in Portland. Do you feel, how do you feel in your soul about trivia and winning? Um, you know, if this was Star Wars trivia, I'd probably be batting a thousand, but uh, we're going to have to see how this one goes. Uh, I feel like I have confidence in you. I think you're okay. gonna yeah, um, I, I believe we're going to get if I score really low. We'll just say it's a golf score. We will appreciate everybody's scores. There you go. They are. Everyone's going to win tonight um, for everyone playing at home. You can play against your quarantine. You can play against your family. You can play a pen against your dog unless your dog is really smart, in which case maybe save that for later or else you'll lose. Um, and maybe play for bragging rights. You can decide who's going to do the dishes, who's going to take out the trash, who's going to get to wear a cape for the next week because they win everything and they're superhero. Uh, John, are you going to play for any kind of stakes with yourself? Um, you know, I hadn't considered it. So there's a lot of pressure for me to, to think through that one right now. I think I'm just going to try and, and just get some answers right without going totally off base. I will say I'll put an option out there. It's a... Uh, Hopefully not too much pressure, but you could play for the prize. My favorite prize to give is the prize of many claps. Ooh, I love the prize of many claps. My kids love that yeah. prize too. <laughs> so yeah, we'll, we got some stakes for you. Uh, nice. The prize of many claps. Are you ready for the first question? All right, I'm ready. Let's okay. do it. Which author wrote the book, The Tipping Point? Was it Mark Twain, Malcolm Gladwell, Cormac McCarthy, or Rachel Carson? So, knowing nothing about these 10 trivia questions, I have actually read this book many, many, many moons ago. Um, and so, I know oh, the know. answer is B, Malcolm Gladwell. You are correct! Woo! He also... Uh, Malcolm Gladwell, if you like Malcolm Gladwell, listen to Revisionist History podcast. It is fascinating. See, you're already an expert in this. It might as already. well be Star Wars how we're going now. Already. Okay. Uh, number two, in financial markets, which animals are used to describe different market conditions? Are they bears and bulls? Lions and gazelles, beavers and ducks, or whales and trout? So, let's see. I know there's a giant bull. Um, I think it's on Wall Street in New York City. I don't think, I, I've been to New York City, but I don't think I've ever seen the bull. Um, and I know, but I, I think it's bears and bulls, but I could not tell you which one is the good one and which one's the bad one. Because I'm... Well, if they put a statue of it in Wall Street... Would, do you think they would do the good one or the bad one as a statue? Maybe they put the bad one as incentive to do well. <laughs> I don't know. Like the, the bulls coming for it. I'm going to go A, bears and bulls. Okay. You're right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. I would, I would love it to be whales and trout. 
I think that would be great. Or at least something a little more related. Bears and bulls, like they don't really hang out together. I was saying they're they're both terrifying animals. Like <laughs> they'll both mess you up. Uh, okay, you're two for two. Do All right. Next one. Whoops. Yeah. True or false? Okay. The topography of Mars is better known than that of the land under the Antarctic ice sheet. <sighs> hmm. The topography. Well, topography indicates, like when you're looking at a map, you're looking at the topography. You're looking at the contours, the hills, the mountains, the valleys. So land that's underneath an ice sheet would be hard to know. So I'm going to say true. I want to pause for a moment and really appreciate you showing us your thought process here. It's yeah. really And it's hey. Yeah, right. your thought process, your, your reasoning skills are right on point. Good thing. Right. Okay, are you ready for the I'm next ready. one? Uh, in oh, years, this is going to be a sad question. <laughs> How many pounds of CO2 or carbon dioxide are emitted to the atmosphere by humans? In recent years, so this isn't like every day, this isn't like daily, monthly, annually. Yeah. I mean, I'm just going to... I don't know. 81,000 seems like that's, I feel like 81,000 is what I personally, John produce like once a week. Like that's what my brain tells me. Uh -huh. I'm going to go big with this one. I'm going to go bigger at home. I'm going to say D 81 trillion. Um, yeah. I feel like the, the most scary option is usually the correct one with climate change. In this one. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. So the A really is probably what I'm producing on just all on my own. Every it's, time you fart, uh, that's what happens. That's man. So much, <laughs> so much. Um, you're doing amazing so far. One all right. You're well on your way to many claps, sir. I'm, I'm excited. Uh, okay. This one's a little bit harder. We got a little biology happening here. The increase in blank is associated with a tipping point in lakes that transition from clear water to an algal bloom. So um, lakes go from clear to being full of algae. Is it because there's more, the higher temperature? There are more nutrients. There is a higher pH, which would mean it's more basic. Or is there more fish? I don't think it's fish. I'm debating between temperature and nutrients because I know, I remember, I think it was planet earth. One of them, they captured some amazing video of this lake it turns pink or blue or green or something, something, but uh, it has to do, it, it has to do with high temp. It, I, I'm pretty sure it was temperatures and because the temperatures unlock what's in the water already. What are the, what might help the algae like live? I mean, I know you've got nutrients and I know you're an educator. So you're asking me leading questions. <laughs> uh, you know, algae, what, if we think about what algae are, they're like little living, little living things. But they also do photosynthesis, right? Uh, yes. Gosh, see, now I'm confused. You know what? I'm going to take your teacherly hint. I'm going to go with B nutrients. <laughs> Even though I was, yeah, see, I was thinking A, but uh, I'm going to go with B. I, I think you used some really good science skills of incorporating new information and reevaluating your answer. These are really wonderful science skills we're there doing. We um, we're always learning. Sciencing first. still halfway through. Still okay. at a <sighs> Ooh, another possibly... Nope, this is great. Yeah, okay. Uh, so which greenhouse gas changed the most in percentage terms in the last 300 years? Is it nitrous oxide, methane, carbon dioxide, or ozone? Well, I have to say carbon dioxide is the one I hear about the most. Um... I'm pretty sure ozone is what surrounds the planet, but ozone is also three little oxygen molecules next to each other. I don't know how I knew that one. Um, 
I'm going to, I feel like carbon dioxide. I feel like C is a safe answer. So I'm going to go with uh, C for this one for carbon dioxide. It is safe. But uh, when we were thinking about how much uh, you might have been producing 81,000, what, 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 and we, we talked about farts a little bit earlier. I don't know. Oh, you want to reference Am I incorporating something? new information? Am I incorporating yeah, you can kind skills? of fold in some past information from a prior question where we mentioned farts. What happens with farts? Um, well, that would be related to methane, I imagine. Yeah, it is. <laughs> hey! <laughs> <laughs> nice. Not just farts, more than so much science farts. going on right now. <laughs> There's so much science. It's in the air. There, yeah, well, the fun thing about science is it isn't just straight knowledge. It's like working through a lot of stuff. So. Application, yeah. Um, okay. We're in the home stretch. Which president said... The issue of climate change respects no border. Its effects cannot be reined in by an army nor advanced by any ideology. Climate change with its potential to impact every corner of the world is an issue that must be addressed by the world. Um, gosh, I'm, I feel like climate change is a bit, because it used to be known as global warming and or some other terms, you know, back in the day, climate change is, I feel like, a, a relatively newer term. So that kind of, that puts George Bush and Barack Obama at the top. And if you just kind of go along party lines, I imagine that Barack Obama is the one who said this. I don't know how to give you more hints on this one. You're it's okay. Just go with it. You were halfway through um, with your. I was totally wrong on the po on the political stuff. See. Yeah, you were right on the on the timeline. I I was halfway there. Yeah. Well, go George W. G, G Dub said that. Okay. -dub. Well, you're you've only missed one so far. So only down one. Okay. You'll get the majority of those many claps, regardless. Okay. So. We get a, a percentage of them. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, give, <laughs> I'll give you the exact percentage of correctness to claps. Um, in what century were the first experiments demonstrating greenhouse gas, oh, sorry, greenhouse effect conducted? Uh, the 1700s, the 1800s, the 1900s, or there are no such experiments? Um, so industrial revolution, late 1800s into the 1900s, but I feel like we wouldn't have thought about it then. I feel like this is like, like I feel like this is like a Renaissance type thing, you know, that we would not have realized that they were researching or experimenting with way, way, way before any of this was going on. So I'm leaning towards the 1700s. Well, the Renaissance was like the 1400s. No, 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 I know. Uh, you, okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> the renaissance in 1799 <laughs> yeah, no no, no but i'm saying like it feels older. like it might be an older thing that you know gosh it's either 1700s or 1900s is what i'm thinking because in the 1800s we just didn't care in the 1800s apparently according to me we just didn't care <laughs> in the 1800s we were just uh Building trains. We're too busy creating those greenhouse gases. To Going westward. Study them. <laughs> um, yes, sir. Let's go to 1900s. C. Oh. Oh, man. The 1800s were way better. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, you started, like, <laughs> you started oh. off pulling out the 1800s. Then you kind of put them behind. I, yeah. Um, I switched it off too early. This is, also, this is also an accurate depiction of those greenhouse effect studies. Yeah. In this is what they looked like. They yeah. Were a teenager on an ice floe with a cell phone. With a giant, giant bear. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe that's why you didn't hear about these experiments. In the <laughs> they were all eaten <laughs> by giant polar bears. Okay. Ooh, this one's got a lot of text. Okay. Oh, wow. The Syrian civil war and the exodus of Syrian refugees into Europe illustrates the concept of tipping points. But what forced this dramatic change? 
Was it A, a climate change induced drought, which caused water conflict? B, climate induced crop failures, unemployment and migration? C, violent authoritarian response to popular protests in the wider context of the Arab Spring? Or D, climate induced crop failures and protests about spiking bread prices? Oh my goodness gracious. This is a, uh, this is a, a deep, heavy question here. Um, I think you need E, all of the above, or something like that in this one. Well, so you have two answers that say climate-induced. Climate-induced crop failures. So I'm actually going to rule those out right off the bat. There's three that say climate-induced. Well, okay, yes. But the, the climate-induced crop failures mm. is a phrase in two answers. I'm... Gosh, A and C are seeming the most, because to be honest, I mean, I, I, I followed it however many years ago, but not closely because it was very, very complex and heartbreaking, to be honest. So you could continue your original line of thought in eliminating things. Yeah. I mean, if A is also climate, I mean, you've got three answers that are climate change related with only one outlier. So let's pick the outlier with C. Look at that problem solving and deduction. Man, look at that. Um, excellent, yeah, deductionary work. I think that's how you say it. Sure. Are you ready for the final question? Final countdown, here, here, here it comes. Final, <laughs> the final countdown from 10. Research shows that climate change can induce tipping points in patterns of human mig migration when it A, destroys people's homes, B, destroys people's livelihoods, C, destroys bars and restaurants in the city center, or D, destroys people's lovely landscaping. I mean, I would migrate if my lovely landscaping was destroyed. Um, that edge I don't, is pretty great. Yeah. yeah, I don't think it's that. I'm not going to go with bars and city uh, bars and restaurants. I'm having a hard time with destroying people's livelihoods because unless it's a very agricultural. Um, it would just be like your job in general, right? It's your society. Life. Yeah. But like if your job is, I don't know, in an office building. Um, uh, gosh. I feel like homes can be rebuilt. I don't know. Let's let's go with B. People's livelihoods. Livelihoods. You Ooh. correct. Nine out of ten. Uh, are you ready? I think that was nine. I lost count. That was great. Thank but you. That was a lot of claps. Those eighteen hundreds, man. They came and got me. <laughs> Those eighteen hundreds. Came and got you. Um. What was your favorite fun fact that you learned or what are you most looking forward to hearing about from our speakers? Um, well, I am happy to know that more was happening in the 1800s than westward expansion and building trains, mm -hmm. train tracks, uh, sorry, railroads. And um, I loved the book Tipping Point. And so it'll be very interesting to just see the application of it all, understand kind of where these guys are going to go with it. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty excited. This is my first science pub with more than one speaker. So Ooh, yeah, pretty cool too. Nice. Um, well, John, thank you so much for playing along. I really appreciate all of your wonderful effort and science skills. Um, all right. I hope you have a great night. All right. You too. Bye. Bye. Okay. I'd now like to introduce our speakers. Ed Brooks, PhD, David Rathel, PhD, and James Watson, PhD, are all professors in the College of Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Science at Oregon State University. Ed studies climate and biogeochemical cycles to understand how the Earth system worked in the past and how it might, oops, and how it might change in the future. David studies how people respond to changes in the weather and climate and James studies the structure and dynamics of complex systems, ranging from ecosystems to financial markets. Ed, David, and James are advanced are dedicated to advancing knowledge and understanding of our planet and people 
to help communities prepare for the coming changes associated with the changes in our environment. Uh, Dr. Watson, are you ready to take it away? I am, yeah. Thanks so much, Rebecca. That was a great introduction. <laughs> Wonderful. I look forward to the talk. Cool. Okay, well, yeah. Um, hello, everyone. It's great to be here. I'm really grateful um, for this opportunity to talk with you along with my colleagues, Ed Brook and David Rathall about tipping points. Um, so I don't think anyone will disagree when I say that we're living in times of great change. In the last several months, our entire global population has experienced a pandemic, the scale of which was only experienced 100 years ago. The COVID-19 pandemic has led to the death of over 400 people uh, globally and has dismantled our society. We all work remotely now. Our children don't attend school and uh, many people have lost their jobs. The pandemic is still ongoing and we are likely to see a second wave later in the year. Now, in addition, there have been and continue to be mass protests around the world against police violence sparked by the murder of George Floyd. Now, two important questions to ask then are, uh, first, uh, will these events create lasting change? Um, and secondly, if they create lasting change, what kind of change are we experiencing? Now, to answer that, that these questions, or at least think about them more deeply, I'm going to use a very different, but perhaps familiar example uh, to us in Oregon, there, at least, uh, that of how freshwater ecosystems in Oregon, our lakes, reservoirs, and rivers, how they change. So I ask that you imagine that you are a fish in one of our beautiful lakes in the Cascades. Eh? So for me, that could be Detroit Lake, uh, just east of Salem. The water is clear and you're, you're having a great time. But unknown to you, the concentration of nutrients in the water is increasing. You can sense this, oh, sorry, you can't sense this, and the clarity of the water isn't changing, at least not yet. But at some point, all of a sudden, the water changes from clear to green. And so what has happened? Well, we environmental scientists describe uh, these events as follows. We first imagine a landscape with hills and valleys. The valleys correspond to states that the lake can occupy. In this case, a clear water state and the algae-dominated algae state, the green state. We started our story uh, with the lake in the clear water state. This is denoted by the orange ball, which is rolled to the bottom of the clear water valley. In the story, the concentration of nutrients was increasing. This acts to make the clear water valley more shallow. The water is still clear, there hasn't been any noticeable change in the, the look of the lake, but it has changed. As more and more nutrients enter the lake, the clear water valley actually disappears. And at this point, the clear water state is unstable. And the system, the lake, rapidly transitions to the alternative stable state, the algal dominated state. Another way to represent this dynamic is to plot the concentration of algae on the vertical axis against the concentration of nutrients on the horizontal axis. Uh, just like I uh, described previously, at low nutrient concentrations, the concentration of algae is also low. But as nutrient concentrations increases, a tipping point is reached and the number of algae in the lake explodes. The tipping point is a threshold nutrient concentration at which the qualitative features of the system, so whether it is the water is clear or not, changes dramatically. So this is the first kind of change. There is a slow change in the background, pressure builds up until pop, the system changes completely. Now it's important to know there's a second kind of change. So let's revisit uh, the landscape uh, analogy. In the second kind of change, instead of something slowly changing the background, like the concentration of nutrients, instead, a shock happens to the system. So this could be a storm that mixes up the water. Um, this could knock the orange ball from the clear water valley into the algal bloom valley. And the system is so hard, it, um, it changes dramatically. Now, in reality, we know that both of these kinds of change can happen. Indeed, scientists study how climate change through warming ocean temperatures is pushing coral reefs past tipping points from hard coral dominated states to alternative states where algae are more prevalent. Now, in addition to climate change through warming ocean temperatures, coral reefs are also impacted by hurricanes, which can hasten this kind of um, uh, ecosystem change. 
Um, in a similar way, financial markets are known to cycle through, bu through bullish and bearish states. And they can be hit by, um, but they can also be hit by relatively quick shocks, like the pandemic uh, this year and, the, and, and transition to a recession. It's exactly what we're experiencing now. Another example are geopolitical systems. And I'll take, for example, the Middle East and the Arab Spring, which is, uh, which is an area that has experienced geopolitical tensions for decades, but also suffered a significant drought leading up to the uprising, and whose impacts we are still seeing today. So tipping points are all around us. They are natural outcomes of the complexity and dynamics of the systems we live in. And here are some of the biggest challenges associated with tipping points. First, there can be cascading tipping points. Now, this is when, unlike the lake example, where we only had two states, a clear water state and an altal dominated state, the earth system, say, uh, may have multiple states that it could transition to. So, for example, imagine that we're currently in a normal valley. Some scientists would call this the Holocene, the environmental conditions that have allowed human civilization to grow and prosper in the last 10,000 years. Now, due to climate emissions, we're likely to see impacts on, say, on ice cover in the poles, say, now, this could push the Earth system past the tipping point to a new hot state, but it might not stop there. In this new hot state, continued heating could then lead to the loss of low cloud cover, as some scientists suggest. This could then push the, uh, the Earth past another tipping point into a hotter Earth state. Another major challenge is that tipping points are hard to see. In the example of Detroit Lake, the fish didn't experience any change in its environment environment right up until the last minute. And this is the hallmark of these kinds of nonlinear changes. Further, once at the tipping point, change can happen fast. If you snooze, you lose. That is, it is very hard to keep up with the pace of change if one is not prepared. And last, once in a new regime, it is often hard to go back to how the system was before. So for example, even if all the fighting were to stop in Syria, it would not look the same, not for a very long time. Now, where there are challenges, there are opportunities. Um, there are opportunities to predict if and when certain systems will go past uh, tipping points. So methods from mathematics, ecology, finance, and neuroscience, for example, have been developed to identify tipping points. In particular, complex systems uh, dynamics can be predicted using a variety of methods, machine learning, for example. In addition, the resilience of networks, which underpin certain tipping points, can be assessed. And they're actually, uh, they do actually exist early warning signals of tipping points that can be used to avoid them. And with these tools, we can step on the brakes and put barriers around tipping points. So this is a slide inspired by Johan Rockström's foundational paper from over a decade ago on, on planetary boundaries. Um, there's this photo of a man next to Victoria Falls. And the story is that you can't actually do this anymore. There's a barrier that stops people recreating this photo. And this is what we can do to tipping points. In terms of our Earth system, Rockstrom proposed several planetary boundaries that we, can, we should not cross. For example, we should not lose certain levels of genetic diversity. We should not lose ozone in our atmosphere. Or oceans, our oceans should not acidify past some point due to the carbon we're putting in the air. If we stick uh, within certain planetary boundaries, our local environments will continue to sustain us as they have in previous centuries. Now, um, there is a chance a strong chance actually that we won't be able to do this. But even then, all is not lost. Even if we're going off a cliff, past a tipping point, say, we can be resilient to the future without knowing exactly what that future will look like. So let me explain using the example of small scale fishermen. These people make a hard living from working on the oceans. They're exposed to all sorts of risks from inclement, inclement weather to the nature of fishing itself, which is, which is just hard. They have developed uh, natural ways of dealing with these risks. For example, diversifying, diversifying the portfolio of the kinds of fish that they catch. So what lessons what might we learn from fishermen? Well, it's that when you're faced with an uncertain future, you should diversify. The last thing to say is that tipping points can be good. That is all the change that we're seeing today, for example, the protests we've been witnessing and participating in, can precipitate lasting change for the better. And here's to that. I'll finish by pointing us to the tipping points that we have lived through and that our children will likely live through. So here's uh, my granddad, John Watson. He passed away a few years ago at the age of 96. 
So he was born around the time of the First World War. He fought through the Second World War. And then after many decades, or and over many decades, he saw um, huge technological advances, the rise of cars, planes, social media. Uh, now, here's my three-year-old daughter, Zoe. Um, and then as she's got some of her granddad, her great-granddad's genes in her, she might live to see 2100, which blows my mind. Now, in that long life, she will most likely witness some of the most grotesque changes to our ecosystems driven by climate change and other things too, maybe even the creation of general artificial intelligence. So yes, we live in times of great change and I'll admit that it is very scary, but there are great opportunities there too. So with that, I will let Ed Brooke put this all in the perspective of geological time. Okay, thank you very much, James, for that uh, great introduction. My job today is to uh, talk a little bit about tipping points in Earth history. What can we learn from a geological record? And as James has pointed out, um, uh, we think about uh, tipping points in some mathematical ways. And when climate scientists get together, they often spend a lot of time defining uh, what we mean by a tipping point, to a certain extent, um, it is something you know when you see it. Um, but uh, those definitions are important. I tend to think of changes that uh, are difficult to reverse if they happen. And that's the kind of thing we look for when we look into the geological record. I'd like to start uh, what I have to say by just looking at something that's happened relatively recently, which is the change in summer sea ice in the Arctic. Uh, this is a, a map of sea ice in uh, January of 1984, and I'll play a video uh, moving that forward in time. And what you'll see is the decline of the sea ice, which always reaches a minimum around September, but what you'll see is that minimum gets smaller and smaller and smaller over, the, over time, and the age of that sea ice uh, gets lower and lower. That's in the, the gray uh, color bar. So that the amount, the amount of ice that persists through the summer and then uh, lasts through the next winter is going down. And this is a, a large change. We've been, I've been observing it for, for several decades. Ice in the climate system is of concern because it reflects sunlight and when it disappears, uh, that causes additional warming in the Arctic. So this is the kind of thing that we, we think about in the Earth system, one of, of many examples. Um, we might imagine uh, a climate system that we've enjoyed for quite a while that has summer sea ice and ask the question about whether we could potentially jump into a system that would no longer have summer sea ice and perhaps lead even to, in the long term, a system without um, sea ice at all in the Arctic. These questions are some of the wicked questions in climate science. We don't know the answer yet to whether uh, shifting sea ice would truly be um, reverse, uh, reversible or irreversible, but it's the type of thing climate scientists are studying. One of our problems with studying the Earth system is that our observations, uh, modern observations don't go back very far. This was, I showed you a movie here from the 80s um, we'd like to have a much longer term record of how the Earth system works. And so to do that, we have to um, delve into geology. And when we look back in time, we know that the Earth system on large and small scales can go through lots of different kinds of changes. We've known for many, you know, a century or, or more that we can go through ice ages uh, and into warm periods like the one we've been living in now for the last 10,000 years, 20,000 years ago, there was a big ice sheet over um, North, North America. And we know by looking further back in time that the Earth's climate has gone through these changes many times. The uh, red line on this graph is, is showing an estimate of global temperature from geological deposits going from 1 million years ago to present. Here we are now, here's the last ice age. The black line is showing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And we understand some things about these cycles uh, that are due to changes in the Earth's orbit that push the Earth's system in different directions. 
And we have lots of examples of shorter term changes within these records that can maybe tell us something about tipping points. And that's useful. And I'm gonna talk about some of those things uh, in the next 15 minutes or so. But it's also useful to point out that this perspective from the last million years isn't exactly like what we're going to be seeing uh, in the next 100 years to 500 years uh, and even longer. And that's because humans are changing the atmosphere. Um, whoops, wrong direction. So um, carbon dioxide uh, was up to about 280 parts per million be, um, at the time of the Industrial Revolution and those experiments about the greenhouse effect. But in 2019, it was 411 parts per million. It's a little bit higher now in 2020. Predictions are that if we maintain a very carbon um, intensive economy, uh, we could get to 2000 parts per million uh, by something like 2240. So a couple hundred years from now. And you have to go back about 50 million years in Earth history to get to 2000 parts per million. We're total, totally capable of making this change. Um, I hope that we won't go in that direction. Uh, but the point is that we are changing the Earth system and we should expect it to, to react. Um, a colleague of mine who died recently and the person who coined the term global warming, Wally Broker at Columbia, used to like to say that the climate system is an angry beast and we're poking it with sticks. I don't know if we want to call it an angry beast, but the point is that uh, we should expect some reaction from this creature that we're poking with sticks. And climate models suggest that a carbon intensive economy pokes the beast pretty hard. So on this graph, um, the sort of boundary between blue and yellow is today's temperature. This is the last ice age 21,000 years ago, it was colder. Carbon intensive economy that's a little bit like the trajectory we're on now pushing that pretty hard, um, gets us to uh, six degrees of warming or so in the Arctic uh, by 2100. And climate models are pretty much in agreement on these trends, depending on how much CO2 you put in the atmosphere, you get a certain amount of warming. Um, but the question about rapid shifts in the system as all of this happening is a little more difficult. Uh, climate modeling is still wrestling um, with um, whether or not it's good enough to predict those kinds of things. So people like me like to look back into the past to get examples of what the real climate system does. And we do that by collecting materials that can tell us something about the history of, um, uh, of the earth. And my research group, uh, happens to do that by drilling ice cores in Greenland and Antarctica and collecting the ice and measuring the composition of the atmosphere in the air bubbles that you can see in this ice core picture. Other people um, go around the world on ships and collect cores through ocean sediments to learn things about changes in temperature and other aspects of the ocean. That's a big, um, big area of research at OSU, in fact. Um, other people do things like go to caves in the tropics and collect stalagmites, which grow very slowly and chemically record things like the amount of rainfall or temperature in the region. Yet other people are interested in sea level change and can study ancient corals to learn about how sea level changed in the past. These, are, these flat surfaces are in New Guinea. This is a famous place where there are records of changes in sea level the island has been slowly rising um, and these represent higher um, sea levels in the past. So we've built up a, a rich sort of catalog of data from different environments that can tell us something about the Earth history. And those data um, suggest places where we might look for surprises or potential tipping points. And this map is from a paper that outlines some of those things uh, it's superimposed on a map of global population density, kind of give you a sense of where people might be concerned about tipping points in the climate system. And there are lots of systems like permafrost melting and tundra loss, boreal forest changes, changes in deep ocean formation in the Atlantic, uh, 
the El Nino Southern Oscillation System, the Amazon rainforest shifts in, in rainfall in the Sahara and so on, and the instability of ice sheets in Antarctica. All of these things have potential tipping point elements within them. What I'd like to do in the time I've got left is just talk about sort of three of the maybe thorniest of these issues that, that have a lot of data from the geologic history uh, to tell something about them. And uh, I'll first say just a few words about past cha rapid changes in temperature in the Arctic that seem to be linked to tropical rainfall changes in the tropics. I'd like to say a little bit then about rapid changes in that gas we talked about in the, uh, the trivia, atmospheric methane, what that might mean for permafrost um, loss. And then finally end by talking about sea level and changes in the West Arctic ice sheet. So um, for several decades now, scientists who drill ice cores in Greenland, this is the, a map of the Greenland ice sheet, have collected this sort of curious record going back about 100,000 years that shows that temperature in Greenland was nice and steady for about 10,000 years. But then when you go further back in time into what we call the last ice age, temperature in Greenland jumped up and down repeatedly over and over and over again. And some of these changes are pretty big. They, are about, they represent a change of about 10 to 15 degrees centigrade in, in less than a century. They're quite remarkable. And they just haven't happened more recently. And uh, we've built up a lot of understanding about these rapid shifts in temperature in Greenland and how they're linked to changes in other parts of the world. And clearly, this is a phenomenon that we, we need to look at and sort of think about what it means for the future. These temperature estimates come from the chemistry of the ice. Um, if you ever get back on an airplane and, and fly across the Atlantic to Europe um, and you have a nice clear day, you might actually be able to see these changes in the ice sheet. This is the margin of the Greenland ice sheet. Then the person for scale is kind of right at the edge where the ice is melting out. And these dark colored bands here are actually the dusty layers from the cold periods on my previous graph and in between the whiter colored ice are the warm periods. But it's sometimes nice in geology to actually be able to see the thing that we're measuring with, with chemical techniques. And if you're in the right, right airplane seat on the right day, you can see these layers as you fly over Greenland. Now, what's happening when we see these abrupt climate shifts? Well, we seem to be going from a cold mode to a warm mode very quickly. Most of the evidence suggests that that's because the ocean circulation in the North Atlantic can shift uh, very rapidly. And this is a cartoon with a lot of information on it about what a, a cold stage of those periods is like with Atlantic currents um, not too far north. These currents are important because they carry heat towards the high latitude northern hemisphere. And in this phase, uh, we also observe that rainfall moves southward in the tropics. By contrast, the warm mode seems to be a phase where we jump to the circulation of the ocean moving much further northward. Uh, and then rainfall in the tropics also seems to move northward. So this is more like today. Uh, and the other stage is more like the ice ages, but we see that we can jump in between. Um, and uh, there's a big question in the climate community about what kind of a transition this is, if it's sort of a shock that pushes us from one system, one state to the other, or if it's a naturally oscillating mode. And there are big questions about whether the, the climate system can do this in the future. Uh, for a long time, people really worried about that because we think the North Atlantic circulation is actually slowing down today. Uh, the latest science is that we probably are not going to see a big shift towards colder climates, but we're still worried about the, the changes in, in circulation patterns. One of the things that uh, I, I think we should be thinking about is the fact that when we shift these, these shifts happen, we get drying in certain parts of the tropics, and we know that those are that, uh, for other reasons in the modern climate system, is associated with a huge amount of biomass burning and wildfire. So, um, you know, there, there's, there's definitely a sense that these shifts are things we still need to be thinking about and trying to predict. I'm going to change gears a little bit to talk about methane now. Uh, one of the things we've observed in these ice cores is that when the climate jumps up and down, 
the amount of methane in the atmosphere jumps up and down. Now, we were talking about that during the um, trivia, and um, you know, we worry about methane from cows in the modern environment. In the past, methane goes up and down because of mostly bacteria in wetlands. But you can see that it, it really likes to jump really fast uh, during this, this last ice age. And this has got people thinking about whether this stuff is coming out of permafrost and whether as we warm the earth more, could we reach a point where we would melt the permafrost so much that we would release methane from both permafrost soils and this funny frozen methane hydrate uh, material that exists both in permafrost and in, in, uh, in the ocean near the continents. And there are um, these ideas that there might be a methane time bomb. It's really rapid shock to the system by warming the Arctic. And um, I'm on the side that this is probably not the biggest risk for methane. Uh, colleagues of mine and I have studied the chemistry of the methane in the atmosphere. And it looks like it's coming from wetlands and not, not from this kind of an environment. The bigger problem with methane is, is, is just that, as we, we saw earlier, it's going up a lot. So here's the change in atmospheric methane um, and it's really changed dramatically and it's um, still second only to carbon dioxide and its greenhouse power. The reason for these changes is human activities, including cow farts and cow burps and, and um, fossil fuel production and, and burning of forests and so on. So if you hear about the methane time bomb, I think it's not the biggest problem we have with, with methane. Finally, I'd just like to say a little bit about fast changes in sea levels. It's a big topic in climate science. In 2014, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change put out these predictions, which suggest that sea level will go up by a little less than a meter, uh, even in a carbon intensive economy by 2100. That's got some bad consequences for a lot of places uh, um, around the United States and the world, even uh, this kind of change. But uh, we know that sea level on longer time scales can change quite a bit. The sea level is about 360 or more feet lower uh, during the ice age than it is today. If we melt all the ice on land um, in a carbon intensive economy, eventually we would uh, increase sea level by uh, up to 50 meters or, or maybe even more, depending on how much Antarctica melted. Uh, and we will gradually continue to melt the ice sheets as we warm the planet. But one of the questions we have now is whether that can happen faster than we, we think, um, what, than some of the models have predicted in the past. This is the Thwaites Glacier in Antarctica. This is a place that's under uh, intensive study right now because of some fears that it might be dynamically unstable as other parts of West Antarctica also might be. And the reason that we're concerned about that is that the, when the ice meets the ocean, there are some particular geometries of how it's configured that might make it very susceptible to being pushed uh, across a tipping point, essentially. Uh, that has to do with the slope of the, the land underneath the ice sheet, which goes down inward, which means that as you remove ice, you get more and more flux of ice out this direction. And uh, there's also some concern that these cliffs that are formed are actually very unstable and can fall apart quickly. Now, one of the reasons we're worried about this is we know that when the Earth was just a little bit warmer than it is now, 130,000 years ago, sea level was about 8 or to 10 meters higher. So that's a lot, 24, 30 feet higher than today. We don't really know how quickly that happened, or, or there's a lot of controversy over that. But we know that that sea level could be quite a bit higher. And interestingly enough, the threat of this sea of this West Antarctic ice sheet uh, collapse uh, is not new. Uh, in the 1970s, in fact, was the first time uh, somebody named John Mercer at Ohio State predicted that. Um, some of the suggestions of, of sea level loss um, are truly alarming. Um, one of the papers that's worked on this suggests up to uh, 15 feet of sea level change by 2200. Other people have been suggesting now that these models are probably overestimating the change. There's a huge uh, scientific effort right now to understand how much of a risk there is here. Um, I just end by saying uh, something about, about this as a climate scientist. And, you know, I think about climate change, but I think like a lot of people, I don't necessarily notice it every day in my life. 
Um, but I've been thinking about it recently because this is a photograph of, of a road that goes to a house that my grandfather built in 1950. And in the last decade or so, the road started to flood every year. And the flooding is clearly related to sea level rise. Uh, and so this is my own personal tipping point. Once the sea level gets high enough, the, the town probably won't rebuild the, the road again. Um, that's a little bit depressing. So um, I think, um, you know, there are ways that we can avoid these disastrous changes that in uh, related to climate. And I believe um, David will hopefully take us a little bit in that direction. So we'll turn it over to David now. On mute. Um, I think you can see what I'm looking at. Okay, so I'm David. It's really nice to be with you. This what a weird way to present from a sweltering living room. Um, it's it's a pleasure to be with you. It's nice to join my two colleagues, James and Ed, on this. So um, I'm going to be talking about the relationship between climate change and human migration. One of the fundamental concerns of climate change is that it's going to render parts of our planet uninhabitable, um, less suited for um, livelihoods and, and for the ways we've lived in the past, the ways, the ways that we, we live in our cities. Um, and, and Ed just gave this, this really, um, a, a range of examples about how the earth system can tip quite suddenly. Um, but none are so easy to visualize and understand as sea level rise and what it might do to coastal communities. Um, as the sea slowly, um, rises at the level of the, the, of the oceans, um, go up, there's the frequency of, of coastal flooding, of, of inundation, of erosion, that can make it very difficult to, um, to live and make a living. Um, so at some point, people who are living in coastal environments, it becomes too costly, the risk becomes too high. Uh, the cost of, of repairing damages is, is too much and, and people simply give up and, and um, they reach a tipping point um, and they migrate and migration is a, is a signal that we've we've crossed that tipping point. Um, so this is a map by some of our colleagues who um, of, a, of a US coastal state 10,000 years from now, um, if we keep emitting greenhouse gases at the same rate we are, we continue on a business as usual track um, until the year 2100. And this is, you know, it takes a while for greenhouse gases to catch up. Take a guess what state this is. It's Florida. <clears throat> Um, this is what Florida looks like. Um, so all of the millions of people who live in this, this area, along these coastal environments in these cities, Miami, Orlando, the schools, um, the hospitals, uh, the neighborhoods that will all become uninhabitable. Um, Disney World. At some point, all of this will reach a tipping point. Um, so here's another state. Uh, take a minute. This one's easier. Um, it's Louisiana. Okay, so at, at some point as the sea levels rise, um, risk will become too great to persist in locations. And so people from New Orleans uh, will eventually migrate out. They'll reach a, a threshold, they'll give up and they'll migrate. And so for those of you who are old enough to remember Hurricane Katrina in 2005, that tipping point already arrived for some people who live um, in parts of New Orleans, the lower ninth ward, um, where people were flooded out dramatically um, and they moved. So what you're looking at is a map of, of the locations where those people went. Um, so just two things to point out, it seems apt right now, that um, these impacts generally in climate change impacts, but in the specific case of Hurricane Katrina, fell disproportionately to people of color and neighborhoods of color. Um, and that's because these communities lived um, in areas, neighborhoods that were neglected um, where the bank, the embankments that held back floodwaters were, were neglected for, for decades. Um, and we could, we, could, we could spend some time on that. Uh, the second point is that look at all the places where these people moved. Even in Portland, Oregon, we have people who were um, displaced and, and relocated. And so one of the points that that makes is that even when an impact occurs somewhere else and a, and a threshold is crossed, then it affects other places far from... Um, the location of impact. Um, so migrants, when they arrive, they're going to need jobs. They're going to need health care. They're going to need schools. 
infrastructure, but they're going to bring skills and experience and culture. And so migration is always a positive thing, but we have to plan for it in order to maximize the benefit of it. Okay, so we're getting better at predicting where we think um, migrants are going to go when sea level eventually rises and, um, <clears throat> and, and inundates different locations. So this is Norfolk, Virginia, the Mid-Atlantic States. This is a super vulnerable spot. Um, and by the year 2100 under uh, business as usual um, emission scenarios, this is where we think th these folks are gonna go. We can predict over a, over a century where they're going. And we can see that on the West Coast, um, we're gonna have to prepare for, um, for migrants who are arriving. Um, but one of the points, so returning to the things we know, James's um, talk, tipping points are hard to see. They happen quickly, they happen locally, and it's difficult to know when they're gonna happen. And what you're looking at is a, um, is a community in Honduras. This is um, Bataya. So on the left, you see the, this is a, uh, the community to the north is the Caribbean, to the south is a river. And this is a community that was catastrophically flooded um, during a, a tropical storm. There's no going back. The community center was destroyed. It took a school, it took a municipality, it took this, the market and it, and it, um, this, this, the town will never go back. This area in the, from the perspective of human time scales, we're not going back. Um, and it happens suddenly. And this is, this is how these sorts of changes are going to occur locally, um, suddenly. So this is, a, a, a the remains of a house on the main street. Um, so while we can think about long periods of time, uh, predicting where migrants are gonna go and where they, the condition that they might go in, it's very hard to know exactly when. Um, and it's because of this, this, the, the problem of tipping points. Um, so what can we do um, about these tipping points? Uh, a couple of thoughts on this. So this figure that you're looking at is, uh, this is how we like to think about the climate scientists in the room will recognize this. This is um, how we, I like to think about future emissions and what they're going to do to our planet. And so under this very low emission scenario, just kind of in the future, this is, we, we built these climate models and we've run these models over and over and over, and we try to uh, associate climate change impacts with these models. This is what we think is going to happen to sea level in the coastal United States and in the number of people exposed under this low emission scenario. So under a high emission scenario, this is the business as usual scenario, there's quite a lot of change that happens. So another something like 16 million people predicted to be affected. And so in the, on the face of it, if we can figure out how to reduce our emissions soon, then we can get this, we can, we can, we can do something about these tipping points. And so this is key. We can control the tipping points from the emission side. Um, <clears throat> But for those communities, once a community is already exposed to sea level rise risk, what can be done? What can be done about the, the sorts of um, um, thresholds that we, we would expect? And um, so what's your, uh, this figure shows the probability of being exposed to sea level rise um, in one, um, in, in a specific year over elevation. So if you're, a, if you're a community at a certain elevation, you've got a low probability of being exposed to sea level rise in any given year. And so that little, that dark orange wedge is current, ri current risk to sea level rise, but that light orange wedge shows how it's going to evolve in the future. So community now that's exposed to summer rich, uh, risk will, um, will definitely be um, exposed in the future. Okay, so take that orange wedge and let's map it onto some kind of hypothetical community. Um, all of these migration dynamics are occurring simultaneously anytime you expose um, uh, a population to, to sea level rise risk. So all of this stuff is happening all at once. These thresholds are being crossed in different ways and these different outcomes that, that we actually know something quite a bit about. Um, there's a point I want to make here, and it's that we have a huge amount of ability to affect all of these different migration dynamics. Some of these are problematic. Um, so if, if we stress out a coastal environment, we might get super rapid urbanization somewhere as people who are, who are um, you know, displaced from their homes move to a nearby city. Or we might see these mobility traps, as we call them. This is people who are stuck. They don't have the, the means to move. And so they're, um, they're, they're stuck in, in, in conditions of increasing vulnerability. Those are just two of the concerning dynamics. 
it turns out that there are various policies we can do to affect the outcome. So look at me, don't look at this, 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 I'm about to flash up a bunch of text. These are all the things we can do. The point is here, there's a, there's, we have an incredible amount of control over the outcomes. It's not just that the sea level rise is going to affect us and that we have to submit to it. It's, um, we, we're in the driver's seat. So um, I want to end on this. Can tipping points be advantageous? Um, what you're looking at is a representation of a switch to a low carbon economy. Again, there's that like ball and in, in, in a basin is the earth. It's a planet. We're in a high carbon intensive, we're in a carbon intensive economy and we're stuck there in that basin. We can't, we can't roll out. Um, so what would it take for us to tip to a, a decarbonized state? Um, there are different social processes happening at different time scales and at different levels of society that we can adjust um, to increase the likelihood that we would tip from this business as usual, high carbon state to a, a decarbonized economy. So let me just run through these super quickly. This is, this is meant to, to end on a note of optimism. Within a year, we can start preparing our financial systems for the shock of divesting from fossil fuels. And we've already done this in big institutions like Oregon State University. We no longer rely on a, a fossil fuel economy uh, to, to keep the lights on. We can do this. We can do this within a year. Within five years, we can start building better climate modeling systems um, with information feedbacks that tell us what to do, where we're emitting too much carbon dioxide and where we can, we can do better. Within a decade, we can transition our energy systems and the adaptedness of our, of our cities, of our coastal cities. So we can start working on this now and within a decade get there. Um, and over the next generation, we can start, we can reorient our education systems uh, to prepare for um, a climate vulnerable future uh, where we need to be prepared. So um, what, what our children are gonna need to know to survive the 22nd century. And so the thought is that if we start to adjust these processes now, that will increase the likelihood that at some unexpected moment in the future, we can suddenly transition to a decarbonized state. Um, okay, so a last thought here. Um, thinking about tipping points, climate change, COVID-19, this the situation we're in. As quarantines hold all over the place, we know that people are traveling less and that global emissions are down. Um, and in cities all around the planet, um, cities that were once uh, smoggy, um, polluted, that, we're, that people are seeing the stars at night um, and they're seeing evidence of, of nature all around them. So you're looking at a picture of New Delhi, India, um, where the first, for the first time in a generation, um, you can see the Himalayas in the background. And so you see that down at the bottom there are these people staying on their roof, like what a marvel. People have never have grown their whole lives and lived in the city and never seen that those mountains were there. And so we know from other places where there's a dramatic change in environmental quality that people um, as voters, as constituents, as, as, um, as a population, they demand that we, we maintain those environmental conditions. So we can hope that, um, that people in these places and in cities like this all around the world uh, will, will, won't accept a return to the smog and that, and that, um, that this can be a thing that, that we've crossed a tipping point. This can be a thing that that persists. Um, all right, well, um, I guess now we open it up for question and answer. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, everybody. That was wonderful. That was a lot of information. Um, are you all ready to answer some questions? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Maybe it's a little bit hot. Everyone's a little bit tired. Mm -hmm. It's sweaty over here. Yeah. <laughs> I cooked the pizza um, for dinner. It was a bad decision. Huh? I cooked a pizza for dinner. It was a bad decision. It's a. Um, Oof. Yeah, I had ice cream for dinner, and it was an excellent decision. <laughs> um. Okay. Our the first question I'm going to ask um refers to the trivia, uh question about Syria. And someone was wondering why the protests were happening in the first place and if it was related to being able to self-sustain or not. And if the protests are happening because of a uh, climate situation. Can you just say, say the first part of that question again? Um, why were the protests happening in the first place in Syria oh, yeah. related to being able to self-sustain or not? So I, I'll, I'll uh, 
I have my answer, but I, and David's actually an expert in, in this particular region. But in the photo that I presented in my talk, you, you'll notice that the, um, the protests in Syria, they were waving baguettes. Um, and that's because um, preceding the, the um, Arab Spring, there was a big uptick in the price of food, of grain. And that's thought to be connected to this prolonged drought uh, in, in, the, in the Middle East. And so the initial initial protest, initial the spark of the of the Arab Spring was actually thought to be related to this, um, yeah, change in, in food price and driven by an environmental change. But you know it's a very complex system as well, and that's not the sole reason why the Arab Spring unfolded as it did. And maybe David, you could comment on on the complexity of the system there, of the situation there. Yeah, I mean, a simple answer to that is that there was a similar. So there was an anthropogenic. Uh, a, a climate change signal on the drought that was happening in Syria at the time of the, that the civil war broke out. But there was at the same time, a, a, sim a drought of a similar magnitude happening in California, and there was no drought there, or sorry, no civil war there. And so, um, uh, I mean, there was the Arab Spring that was happening throughout the region. Pe uh, people were discontent with their governments um, for, for generations of bad policy. Um, and and it, it moved like from dominoes from country to country. And so we could talk about some of the, in the case of Syria, there were some bad policy responses to the drought. You know, they didn't, um, the government had a really sloppy response um, to the drought and that could have exacerbated discontent. But to say that the climate change caused a war is just, that's, I would say that's irresponsible. Yeah, thanks. That was some good context for that. Um, okay, next question. I'm not sure who to direct this towards, but in your research, what have you found to have the greatest impact on climate change, negative or positive? It's kind of a broad question. <laughs> I can, I mean, one answer for me is we study the history of the gases in the atmosphere and, and to document how the Industrial Revolution changed the atmosphere so remarkably, so quickly. I think it's, it's a powerful symbol, you know, and it's the thing we come back to all the time to just convince people that this is different. You know, we're not in a natural cycle. Um, and I hope that has an impact. Um. Okay, what are the best ways for communities like Portland and other West Coast cities to best prepare for and accommodate climate migrators? Ooh, that's a good question. I think I might be the one on the hook for that. Um, so, I mean, this is the, if we were to make predictions about where people are gonna go because of climate change impacts, because they're looking for safer climates to live in, then it's a pretty safe bet that the, that the Pacific Northwest is, is would be a place that receives climate migrants. And so what we, um, just a couple of quick answers is that migrants who are motivated by climate change impacts are going to enter um, normal migration routes. And so people who are normally migrating um, from California um, might, those, those sort of migration flows might be accelerated or people who are migrating from the South, those, those flows would be accelerated. So it's people with the greatest capacity who are going to, um, and the greatest means are going to be migrating first and people with the least means last. And so we can think about that and we can use that. Um, that's, that's something we could consider. Um, I, I mean, there's a lot I could say about this and maybe I should just uh, uh, end it there. <laughs> it's a pretty complicated answer, but um, we know that, that um, Host communities do better when we prepare for migrants and when we accept migrants and when we uh, plan on migrants and, and we um, take advantage of migrants. And, and migrants do better when, they're, when they enter an environment when they're planned for. Um, and so these, there's all these win-wins that we can, we can leverage by just being ready, open to migration. So I guess I have a personal follow-up question to that. Like in terms of preparing, like as you were saying, preparing for migrants, how much of that would be like, social and emotional, just feeling like, like being accepting to new people moving in versus more infrastructure um, and like social services? Well, like policy follows culture. So um, yeah, 
let's uh I, I would say we, we we have like the norms and values about openness towards migration that would that would manifest in culture or sorry in policy then we make policy on the basis of that um around planning uh etc so yeah there's a lot i could say i'll just i'll just keep it short <laughs> i mean we've got plenty of time so <laughs> um okay next question is what do you do I think maybe this is like you personally, so all three can answer. Um, what do you do to reduce reduce your carbon footprint? I um, could go first. Or go ahead, James. No, 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 no. please, <laughs> after you. Ed, you sounded like you this had a, a very well-formed response. Well, it's a question scientists, climate scientists get a lot. And, you know, I have a couple of different kinds of answers. Like, what is that I... I have to live in the world I find myself in, um, like we all do. And, and so we have political structures and economic structures that we struggle with and don't always let us do all the things that we think are right because um, they need to change. So obviously voting and, and is, is an important part of that. I mean, personally, I, we, my family has changed its um, habits. You know, I've purchased cars that are much more fuel efficient. I now make all of the electricity we use over the course of a year with photovoltaic power. But I was in a position to be able to do that. That was expensive. And, um, you know, not everybody can, can do that. Um, nonetheless, the biggest part of my carbon footprint until recently was definitely flying for work-related travel. And that's something I still struggle with. Yeah, so on, on my end, you know, yeah, there, there are all these very lo local personal things that I, my, me and my family try and do. So we try and, I mean, they, they seem small and they are small compared to the problem. But if we do them all ourselves, it's, it's a, 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 as a collective solution, it is big. So things like, you know, use your, even on a hot day like today to try and limit the amount of air conditioning that you use. I ride my bike to work, my compost, do all these things. And like, like it, I... Um, I don't travel so much anymore. You know, as scientists, it was, I, you know, we do get the opportunity to travel internationally um, for our research, but I've committed myself to not doing that um, and uh, actually, you know, having our meetings online. And the other thing is, so th those are the small things and then maybe the medium things are, you know, what you want to do with your career, with your skills. And um, I was lucky, I've, I've been lucky enough to work with some really brilliant people and I've decided to dedicate um, my sort of collaborative network that I'm, I find myself in to finding solutions to climate change. And that, uh, that's, that spans everything from working on tipping points, mathematically modeling them, understanding when we can predict them, these kinds of things, all the way to um, entrepreneurship and, and thinking about new clean tech solutions. Uh, the, 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 this is where um, yeah, s solutions that improve our ability to adapt to climate change will, will come from. Those are really good answers. And I, and I would just add that any individual contribution we can make to reducing carbon dioxide is pretty small compared to big structural changes around our energy systems. And if we were to really, really transform the way we, we, we generate electricity um, for, for our institutions, for our, for our neighborhoods, then we can make a lot of progress immediately. And, um, and so uh, we got to get behind these big structural changes. Can I add one, one more? That segues thing? really well into my next question. Did you have anything? Uh, oh, yeah, I just wanted to add, you know, I think I teach students about their carbon footprint sometimes. And I think people struggle with knowing what the best low hanging fruit in their own life is. And there is some good information out there about, you know, the carbon footprint of different things that you do. And uh, it's always good to, to start with the easiest ones. Um, yeah. So the next question would be, um, what are some of the best ways to advocate for the larger systemic changes or what are some good entry points into, I know there's, there's a lot of different things people could do, like voting is one, but what else um, can people kind of focus on or dig into to help make those systemic changes happen?
Um, <laughs> so, I, you know, I, I, my focus is, is climate change impacts and adaptation. And so I, I can straight, you know, straight out of my lane and, and, and talk about some of this stuff, but, um, uh, you know, it's, it, there, there are, there are technologies that we can, we can pay for now. Um, so when, when, when I, you know, get my power bill every month, um, I have the option of, of, of paying a premium for renewable energy. And so that's something that I choose to do. Um, you know, we can, we can make a whole range of decisions like that. Um, and so that's, that prepares the market for um, technological and, and structural change that, um, that, that would be helpful. Um, but like we, I mean, we can support electoral, we can expect, we can, we can, um, we can support um, political initiatives and politicians who are, who are behind uh, clean energy and transitioning our, our energy grid. And that's, that's something we should, we ought to do. Right. I'll just say that like this idea of system, changing a system is really it, it hard. It's really interesting and it's a hard problem to solve. And you can either try and change it from the top. So if, uh, if you're in school today, why don't you try and become the president? And then you can change it from the top. We, one of you might be that. One of you might be able to do that. The other way to do it is from the bottom, and you can. And that's that's changing your own personal um, change the system from the from the bottom. So that's not just changing your own behaviors and, and beliefs, but influencing uh, others around you. And so that just comes down to talking to people. Everything from just talking to people um, to uh, creating, I think, solutions. Um, mechanisms that are infectious um so just like david was saying that if you know that there's a pre uh, an option to buy premium on energy that's uh, created from renewables um you know, spread that make make that infectious and uh it's a bad time to use that word i guess but um but the, that's a norm that could spread and if everyone um changed to that norm the system changes too Great. Uh, do you want to add anything? You're on silent. I was thinking slightly more local, you know, the, there are policies at the state level that either encourage um, reduction in fossil fuel consumption or, or don't. Uh, for example, um, rebates for photovoltaic power, which recently went away and then came back in another form, um, advocating for more of that with uh, the people that make those decisions because um, one one way to help create structural change. And I think there's, uh, I've watched my little block, you know, with solar panels blossom because uh, we all felt a little bit guilty when the first person did it. So uh, I, I think I would agree with James, but spreading the word. Um. My next couple of questions are both around dust. <laughs> um, is there likely to be a dust bowl in our future? Hmm. Well, there is one in the uh, in the Atlantic right now. Now, right? If, if you saw the news, there's this giant uh, dust storm being blown off the Sahara, which which is a naturally occurring phenomenon. But this is the magnitude of this is off you know off the charts right now. Was, my second question about dust was about that in that dust storm in particular about if if that was caused by climate change and what it means for the U.S. All right, maybe I, I mean I'll, I'll give David. Did you want to say something? I was going to say, Ed, one of you, the one of the the tipping points you were going to talk about was the shift in rainfall in the mid latitudes, right? Um, and um, and so this is one of this is another one that's kind of drying in the Sahel in um, in Central Africa. Um, yeah, the, the general generally climate models suggest that dry places are going to get drier as, as it gets warmer. And the questions of can monsoons permanently shift from to one place or another and create a dry places rapidly. I think it's a little more difficult, but I think generally we will expect um, places that are get dry and dusty now to get worse. Whether that happens here uh, as a consequence of climate change, if that was the question, I think that's a little more difficult to, to address. 
Mm. But wildfire is maybe our bigger, bigger issue to try. Maybe I would just say, I mean, I think wildfires absolutely here and here is here especially. I think and I this is not my area of expertise, but I have to imagine that the difference between now and when the the dust bubble was occurring is uh, technology, and we have um, I implemented m you know massive irrigation in. If we're thinking just about the, uh, the U.S. in in our farming areas of of the U.S., and that's a technological solution that could sustain us well beyond um, the natural ability of of plants in, in certain areas to, to, to live and, and grow. Um, but even with that irrigation technology, um, our dams, our waterways, how we manage our, our, our water, uh, we will likely, it's going to be stressed, it's going to be pushed, and it might even break, which would lead to areas of the US, areas of the world being not just uninhabitable, but uh, unable to sustain um, uh, agriculture. At that point, um, uh, you could, I could imagine, you would see uh, something similar to a dust bowl. Um, as y'all were mentioning, with the dry places getting drier, if and I know, like the Saharan dust storms, they do happen. Will they get worse? Will it get to a point where it's affecting the U.S. or like air travel generally, or any, do you see anything like that? Um, I'm not sure about um, direct effects on most of the United States. I mean, think the dust goes a little farther south, um, and I don't—I I don't know the answer to that, Eric. Yeah, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, um, so you might have guessed. I'm from England, and it, this is something in England we know about because every now and then we would get uh, like a thin coating of red dust on our on our windscreens around this time of year because the, the dust storms from the Sahara would blow all this way. Um, they uh, they have been harmless. I, can't, I, I don't know. This is again not my area of expertise, but I I don't know um, whether they will become a problem in terms of air travel. These kinds of things. Um, but I do know the, the, the phytoplankton in the oceans, they love this kind of stuff because it, um, it seeds the oceans with uh, a lot of essential nutrients and uh, micronutrients. Um, great. Okay. So we'll move on from dust, I think. I haven't read the rest of the questions. It might come back later. I can't guarantee. Um, what kind of technologies or new science will be necessary to better forecast future challenges for our climate? And how can OSU be in the forefront of these solutions? Well, um, I, I, I might have part of the answer and, and maybe Ed has another part. The, the, um, um, the Paris Climate Agreement, what it, what it, um, this, the, the basic substance of it was that we would um, do a much better job at taking stock of our carbon emissions and greenhouse gas emissions in general. Um, and that each country would define um, specific targets and then we'd, we'd move towards those. So we could develop systems that do a much better job at tracking our progress towards greenhouse gas emissions and tell us when we've gone, when we've exceeded those and tell us what we ought to do, the sources of emissions that we need to work on to reduce our emissions. So those sorts of information systems, we can, we're, we're technologically, we're, we're close to there. Now, what, what, what we don't have is the political tools in place um, to, to make decisions about where we would reduce emissions. Uh, and that's, that's the sort of aim of the, of the Paris Climate Agreement is to get us into, to move us towards that position, so. I think, um, can I add to that? that so, I mean, if you're looking for, sort of concrete advances that need to be made. So we rely on these climate models to, to have an estimate of how the world's going to change in, under different climate emission scenarios. And they are, they can, you know, they are good, but they can always be improved. Um, for example, people have been working in the last you know, decade or so um, very hard on, on the issue of clouds, which have been very hard to model. Um, but we've made great progress on there, on, the, on clouds, and uh, improvements to climate models have, have been made. From my perspective, though, so that's the, the primary you know, tool we use to understand climate change. But uh, there's a huge um, emphasis now on 
uh, and trying to model and understand the sort of secondary impacts, not just changes in the climate system, but how will people react? How will people move as, as David is studying? How will people migrate? Uh, but it's a much, it, it is, it's a much bigger problem in, 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 in that all our systems, our sort of world systems, our financial markets, our transport systems, our energy systems, they're all actually super connected at the moment. And you might have heard of the term contagion, um, not in the, not in the uh, context of the pandemic, but in terms of risk and shocks that the climate might start, but then that propagates through um, multiple geographies, multiple systems. Um, and so there's a real emphasis now on understanding how risk um, and, uh, and threats propagate through our world system. So that's another area that we need to understand because in some sense, we, we know uh, a minimum amount of climate change is going to be experienced and that's going to bring with it uh, some threats like sea level rise. Um, and uh, it's understanding the primary, but also then the secondary impacts of these, uh, of these threats. I could put in just a little bit more, maybe a plug for OSU. In fact, a lot of these things are, are happening at OSU. There are many, many researchers in our college and in others who are pushing ahead on the elements of climate models that we need to improve, understanding processes, understanding Earth history. Uh, and there's also a, a brand new um, undergraduate degree in climate science that, that people can take advantage of and study and come learn at it how to solve all these problems. That's great. That's great for me to know. We'll tell them a team volunteers. Yeah. Um, okay. This next one's about alternative energy. Are you ready? Ooh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, what form of alternative energy do you feel has the most potential for positive change? Wind, solar, hydroelectric, et cetera. I, get it. I can give one quick answer, all of them. Yes. Uh, and, and because the scale of the problem, the amount of CO2 we're emitting now cannot be mitigated by any one of these technologies. We have to apply them all in the places where they work the best. Same. Yeah, that's, that's, this, that's my response as well. Yeah. We I would, I would add. Climate change is a problem that, and climate change mitigation, like the reduction of greenhouse gases and the and adaptation, the adjusting to impacts, it's an all of the above kind of, I mean, it's, it, everybody's got a role. Everybody's got a, a part to play. So we can think about just technology for reducing, reducing emissions. It's going to require all of it. Um, but the same could be said of, uh, for other parts of climate change as well. Mm -hmm. Sorry, James, you're... Yeah, just a small point. Yeah, so absolutely all of those things. Uh, 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 in addition, um, you, you could think and look to um, power grids, electrical engineering, actually. It might seem really boring to, to some, I guess, very exciting to others. But yeah, uh, developing new power grids, new smart um, local power grids where you have these multiple inputs of energy into the system that are shared. Maybe there's a marketplace for energy. Um, it, it, is important too. It's not just the generation of energy, it's the provision of it and the use of it. And uh, power grids are an amazing thing, actually. But uh, um, as like uh, other other uh, industries, they're still innovating and, and growing. So there's innovation too on that side. With a follow-up to that question, um, I know there's a push more and more to remove dams um, and just in terms of hydroelectric energy is that a consider is that a, a consideration of balance with the sort of ecosystem balance mm. that's a real trade-off right because i understand that there are these ecological reasons say with salmon with uh, the um, animals that live in the, the rivers and our lakes the reservoirs um but here's here's, here's a flip side to it right as the world is warming say here in the Cascades, we're going to see less and less snow. Um, and snow acts like a reservoir. It's a, it's a slow, it's a storage of water that slowly enters to our rivers, riverways. And that's really key. Um, and so it's important that we have um, 
alternatives because the snow is likely to diminish. So a reservoir is actually really important and keeping reservoirs um, will be really important, not just for um, drinking water, not just for hydroelectric power, um, but for, for many, for many reasons. So, you know, climate change is not easy. You have, because you have these decisions that uh, have to be made based upon trade-offs. Um, it's not going to be, it's going to be, there may be some win-wins, but it probably won't be win, all win-win solutions. Something will have to go in order to sustain and survive what we have. Great. Anything else to add? That's the tough answer. Yeah, that that um, and 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 again, I'm, I, I want to just emphasize that this is not my expertise. The um, generation of renewable energy. This is what we hear from our colleagues who work on this stuff, and and th there are trade offs um, to you know hydro to switching a country like Brazil to hydropower is going to displace a lot of people. Um, and so we have to really consider these trade offs when we're when we're trying to consider um you know sustainable development in the context of all of these uh changes that we might make and um so yeah um so someone wants to know if they had an energy solution how would they get the world to notice or care you know if there's like a path to entrepreneurship i don't know Well, um, if, there, if, 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 if you have a solution, it, um, it should have value. And if it has value, people will want to buy it. Um, and so, as you've said, Rebecca, like entering uh, the private uh, marketplace as, a, as, a, as an entrepreneur is one way of getting that product out. And if it does have its, if it is a solution, and it will have value, it would, it has the potential to take off. Now, there's lots of other reasons why a business might fail or take off, but at the heart of it, if you have a product that works, um, it has that potential. Yeah. Um, I have a, a general math tipping question uh mathematically how far outside of the short term or contemporary state of variability are tipping points can they be anywhere on the curve so um so it, it depends upon what sort of tipping point you are considering so i mentioned that there are two kinds there's this what first tipping point where the um, the width of the valley is increasing and it actually flattens. Um, there's another one where um, you just get hit with the shock and the ball bounces from one valley um, to the other. The, the latter is actually easier to answer that question with. Um, there is a, there's, there's a peak in between the two valleys and at the point of that peak, um, if you were to put the ball on just one side of it, roll down to the other side, versus if you put it just on the other side, it roll down to the other side. Um, and uh, that is the point of curvature, of, of zero curvature. And um, that's uh, called a sep sepatrix. And um, that's the uh, mathematically defined tipping point in this case. Now the point about the first, first type of change is that that curvature disappears as the first valley um, widens and widens, flattens, flattens, you reach a tipping point where um, um, the, the, uh, the, the, the attractiveness of that first state completely disappears and it becomes unstable and the ball rolls into the other alternative state. And so that um, is called a bifurcation. And um, there, is a, there is a critical point. So these are all like loaded mathematical terms but there's a critical point at which that valley disappears. And that could be thought of as another uh, tipping point too. 
can I, I just maybe add a thought, you know, these concepts um, are simple when you see them on a screen, kind of going back to one of the other questions somebody asked, you know, we don't actually know everything about the current climate system. So, you know, to, to, there, are, there are certain aspects of the system where we don't even know the current variability. So to ask um, how far outside we have to be from it could be difficult. For example, what those ice sheets are doing, you know, and exactly what's happening underneath them in the ocean. There, there's a lack of observations um, in some cases that is quite critical. Mm. Um, okay. How significant is the arrangement of continents in understanding the comparison of past climate states with present day? I can, I can answer that one. I mean, if we go back 20,000 years, a million years, uh, two million years, it's not particularly critical. The continents don't move that quickly. When we look at further back in geologic history, it matters a lot. Uh, and changes in continents and the associated changes in the crust and the mantle have driven a lot of Earth's long-term climate change, but it's not particularly relevant to comparing 20,000 years ago to, to today. Um, okay, we've got more electrical grid power stuff, follow-ups. Um, do you think installing hydroelectric generators inside of municipal pipes like Portland did a few years ago has potential to impact in big amounts and might be a good thing for citizens to advocate for? Hmm. I personally have no idea what the numbers are with that kind of technology. It sounds wonderful. Um, and I would imagine that they're are hard numbers to that one could calculate on the energy provision, the cost, these kinds of things. At the end of the day, municipalities, states, if they're going to adopt a new technology, they do a cost benefit analysis. And um, if the benefits outweigh the costs, um, then that technology has life. Um, but if it doesn't, it, does, it, won't, it won't be bought or installed. So it all comes down to those numbers. And unfortunately, I, I don't know what those numbers are. Um, okay. So it's halfway between a comment and a question, I think. I think it's a question, but it's in the form of a sentence. Okay. Uh, it seems what you're saying is we can't keep up with our current distribution and other systems, or we will have more trade-offs that affect the environment negatively. I mean, this, this, um, just to respond to that, you know, we have to, I'm, I'm a um, lead author on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's sixth assessment. And we're meant to, this is this, these big UN um, assessments that we do. And, um, and we're, so we're really meant to, to speak to this issue specifically, the trade-offs of any specific investment. In any society, we have a certain amount of limited resources and we have to, we have to chew, we have to make these choices about how we're going to mitigate, how we're going to reduce greenhouse gases, and how we're going to adapt. And every time we make one of these choices, it's we're taking resources and we're putting them down. And we're there's a there's a there is a trade off. We have to because we've spent money on this, we can't spend money on other things. And and so, um, I mean, there there are folks who, whose entire career is to to work on these trade offs. Um, and I mean, it's a super important topic, but um, I mean. We're, I think we're, do, we're doing our best to speak to it here, but um, it's, it's outside of my, my particular expertise. I mean, if, if we measure our success based on how the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are changing, we can't keep up right now. We need to change things quite quickly, actually. Uh, ooh, okay, hold on. Another question just came in. Um, 
Can you speak to the potential for ecological restoration to help reduce the impacts of climate change? Example, these are things I don't know, so you might need to give a little primer. Uh, the Loess Plateau, the Green Belt Movement in Kenya, agroforestry, holistic management, etc. I can't speak to those specific examples, but I do know, say, um, man, like, that in general, yes, this is really, really important. Um, not only does habitat restoration have direct ecological impacts, as in it improves the e ecosystem, um, the, the diversity of species present, uh, which is critical, actually. This is one of, uh, I mentioned that these planetary boundaries, um, biodiversity is one of them. Um, we are our relationship with nature won't be sustained if we lose diversity. So for that reason, having um, uh, restoring habitats is very important. As a source of, um, oh, as a carbon sink, um, yeah, absolutely too. Um, I think, um, I mean, maybe Ed has a better idea on the magnitude of the, of the, of the flows of carbon in the Earth system. Um, which are huge and often like they, they're quite daunting. And, and to say that, you know, if we restore this one particular area, will it affect the global biogeochemical cycles? It's hard to say, um, but in general, the answer would be yes. And if you have these ecological, positive ecological impacts too, um, uh, they are a good thing. In addition, if, I mean, they, they can be designed in a way that they bring economic um, positives too um, and that's the uh, holy grail actually to try and find the win-win solutions in terms of ecological restorations those that have economic benefits that have ecological benefits and climate benefits too again i can't speak to those specific examples but i do know you know on our coast things like wetland restoration mangrove restoration in in, in, the, in the tropics these are all incredibly um, important habitats that it affect fisheries, which affects local coastal communities, and also act as a carbon sink, as a source of storage of carbon. So we're gonna, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Dave. your turn. Okay, I could, I could say that, um, you know, resilient livelihood systems are ones where there are, there's a diversification, when we have lots of different strategies. Um, and that's possible when there's a, a really resilient ecosystem. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, we, we can talk about um, ecosystem-based adaptation as a really positive thing um, just because it provides a range of livelihood options for people. The other thing is, um, you know, um, there's, there's lots of ecosystems-based um, impact mitigation. So, um, for example, like mangroves in a coastal environment are, are, uh, can really reduce the effects of like a, a tidal surge or a storm surge um, around a... Um, like a, a catastrophic uh, cyclonic event. And so um, ecosystems can, can also reduce the impacts of, of, you know, disasters, climate change impacts, so. I was just going to say that, I can't, I don't think I can speak to those specific examples either, but of the roughly 10 gigatons of carbon we put into the atmosphere every year, most of that's fossil fuels, but a, a decent chunk of it is from land use change, deforestation and other things like that. So slowing those processes is is uh, sort of related to this question, and then changing agricultural practices will impact climate change. Changing the use and production of fertilizers, changing tillage to prevent the loss of carbon from soils, th those are big enough to matter. Uh, you know, and it's a, going back to the previous question. It's not going to solve the whole problem, but it is one of the things that will matter. Okay, um, I have a couple of questions about economy, economic incentives. With the recognition that y'all are not economists, um, would putting a price on carbon help? Would that be a helpful thing to do? I mean, I, I teach a class, a climate justice class, and, and one of the uh, one of the, the things I, I have my students do is. Uh, is calculate a uh, carbon tax. A carbon tax is a really super simple, efficient tool for increasing the cost of carbon and reducing um, the demand for carbon, or sort of the, the willingness to, uh, to, to rely on carbon. So you, as you increase um, 
the cost of it, people use it less. And it's just simple. It's, uh, we, have, we have lots and lots of cases of this working all around the world. Uh, Canada, just to the north, had, had a very successful uh, carbon tax that was implemented in one province and then it spread to the, um, and it spread. Um, so may, maybe I do have something to say about that, but it's, it's super simple, effective tool that um, economists agree on. You know, Rex Tillerson, um, the, the, the um, CEO of, of ExxonMobil, for, uh, former Secretary of State, um, he, he endorsed a carbon tax as a way of reducing emissions from, uh, from the burning of fossil fuels. So, um, I mean, there's, there's broad agreement that a carbon tax is, is useful, would be useful. Okay, next question. Um, how can economic incentives assist the altering or accelerating of a tipping point? For example, a really large incentive for electric automobiles or something like that. Yeah, I mean, I'll give the, my math fee uh, two cents and maybe uh, Ed or David can speak more broadly to it. But um, in the mathematical um, sense, when we model our, our social and ecological systems. That the, the valley and the bore uh, that I use to describe a tipping point actually emerges as a, as a function of individuals interacting and making decisions. And so if you in, incentivize certain behaviors, like the adoption of uh, non-carbon-based fuel or, or energy, um, you're actually going to create this shallowing of um, of a basin of a, of a valley, um, and in this in this case it would be we're in a we're in a carbon intensive valley, but you can shallow that and shallow that some more through incentivizing the adopt adoption of renewables to the point where the carbon intensive valley disappears and the bore rolls into a um, uh, you know a, a fossil free, uh, fuel free. Uh, state or renewable state. Um, so there is a direct link mathematically between individual behaviors, the incentives behind those behaviors, and these tipping points that we're discussing. Great. Um, I think that's it for all of our questions tonight. Thank you all so much for all for your lecture, for your thoughtful responses, um, and just for being here and helping people learn. Thanks so much, Rebecca. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for coming. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Um, so uh, we are out of time. I hope everybody enjoyed tonight's event. If you want to watch the video again, or share it with your friends. You can check out the video section on OMSA's Facebook page or on our YouTube channel. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for updates on future events and inspiring content from OMSI. Um, and I know I mentioned it at the beginning, but please consider supporting Science Pub and making a donation via the Facebook donate button, or you can visit omsi.edu slash donate. And please join us for our next Science Pub next week on Tuesday, June 30th, for a lecture by Gregory Villar, a systems engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. We'll be learning about the Curiosity rover, which is the most sophisticated piece of technology ever sent to our neighboring red planet. And we'll learn why it takes a collaborative effort of over 500 people to, quote, move the joystick. Um, and if you want to join us a little earlier next week at 6.15, we'll have a special night sky presentation by OMSI's Director of Space Science Education, Jim Todd. Uh, so once again, thanks to our partner, Stream for making tonight's event possible. And as always, you can get more information about science pubs, about coming to see Body Worlds, about what's up with the museum, as well as how to do science at home. All that is on our website at omsi.edu. So thanks, everybody, and have a great night.